The Road to the American Revolution. This um, video will correlate with our textbook, Chapter 3, Section 5, beginning in page 98 and going through page 103. Before we can get into the revolution itself, we need to go back and take a look at the period prior to revolution. And that brings us to the French and Indian War. Now, the French and Indian War was a war fought in the Americas mainly um, by, between Britain and against the French and Native Americans. And we're taking, if you look at my pointer here, the area in question is, is kind of this border between the English colonies and the, the frontier land past the Appalach Appalachian Mountains here where Native Americans were coming into contact with uh, colonists who were trying to expand westward. Now, Great Britain won the war for the colonists, but of course, Parliament still had to pay for the war. So in order to pay for the war, they decided to implement some new taxes on the colonists, and the first one was the Sugar Act. Now, as we zoom in on our map here, we can see we have sugarcane, which was grown down here in the, uh, the Caribbean area. So you can see an example of what the sugarcane would look like here before it's harvested. The sugarcane was used um, to produce things like molasses, obviously pure sugar. So anytime the colonists needed to, anytime they imported sugar, or the sugar went from down here in the Caribbean up here into the colonies, um, they had to pay a tax on that. Um, so the colonists were upset. So what would often happen is that the sugar uh, would be, the ships would come down here to to get the sugar, and they would smuggle it on their boat. And so they'd try to put it on their boat in an attempt to get it back into, into the colonies without paying the tax. The Navy was on to this, the British Navy, so they often uh, would intercept and search these ships. And what would happen is unlike British courts, where uh, people were treated as innocent until proven guilty, a lot of these merchants were considered guilty until proven innocent. So along with the, the introduction of this new tax and the inequality of the court system, Americans began to be um, more and more upset with the way the British were dealing with the Americas. In addition to the taxes uh, that many Americans felt were unfair and were to business, they actually thought they, um, that the British um, Parliament didn't have any right to tax the colonies at all. And they, this became popular uh, beginning with James Otis, this gentleman right here, who said uh, that um, the British could not take any man, any part of his property without his consent in person or by representation. So the colonists were in the, under the belief that um, if they didn't have representation in Parliament, that the English had no right to take anything from them, uh, be it tax money or property. So, at a Boston town meeting in, in May of 1764, Sam Adams, this guy right here, he, let's see if he's grabbing a sign there, um, he began to take off on this idea summed up by Otis and be what became the slogan, and you can see it in his, his banner, his, his sign he's holding here, no taxation without representation. And this whole slogan began to spread through the colonies. This slogan is what we call propaganda, or ideas, facts, or allegations sp spread deliberately to further one's cause or to damage an opposing cause. Uh, it also says a public action having such an effect. So what this slogan did is it had the effect of getting people to join the revolutionary cause. One way that Adams helped spread this idea of fighting no taxation without representation was to start what's known as the Committees of Correspondence. And this um, committee, uh, set up all around Massachusetts, got together in other towns and colonies as well, and they shared ideas and information about the new British laws and ways to challenge them. One of the most popular ways to challenge them was by uh, having a boycott. And what, so what they would do, whoops, there goes my title, is they started to say we were going to boycott British goods. So as British goods would come in um, from, o from overseas and the intention was to buy them, uh, the idea uh, took hold not to buy anything that was British. So all British goods that came in, um, or many started to be boycotted. And this was, um, had a, a very um, significant effect um, in, most, in many of the colonies, especially in New England. 
Now, as we move on to the Stamp Act of 1765, another attempt by the British Parliament to raise funds for the British Treasury, we need to remember that the Sugar Act was an indirect tax. And what that means is that only those that uh, purchased the imported goods uh, had to pay this tax. But with the Stamp Act here, it forced colonists, whoops, it forced colonists to buy this stamp for all paper products. And here's the stamp right here. So what they had to do, whoops, we got to turn off the, um, the highlighter here. So this guy here, this stamp, which I'm going to blow it up so you can look at it, what they had to do is they had to go and purchase, um, pay, a, pay a fee to have this stamp put on any kind of paper that they bought. So anytime they purchased anything with paper, uh, it could be playing cards, it could be parchment for whatever, um, anything with paper, they had to put this stamp on it. And this was the, uh, the brainchild of this guy here, uh, uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain at the time, James Greenville. And so his idea to use the stamp comes with immediate consequences. And those immediate consequences are these guys, the Sons of Liberty. There's a famous painting of um, some of the Sons of Liberty that had caused some violence before we've talked about. Um, they uh, started to uh, protest along with others, like Patrick Henry here, Virginia lawyer. And along with... Uh, Henry, the Sons of Liberty, they started to there started to be a growing movement against the Stamp Act. And in fact, here's an example of uh, one of the ways in which they they tried to fight it, uh, kind of mocking the actual stamp. They created their own stamp, and you can see here they say it says at the bottom, "Oh, the fatal stamp." And uh, the idea was was presented to the the colonists at the time that the Stamp Act. Um, was going to be death to the colonies. If you kind of see here, the uh, you see the skull and crossbones. So they associated with this dreadful stamp tax um, to be death, and it worked. And eventually, the Stamp Act Congress was able to get the entire Stamp Act repealed. In fact, in this political cartoon here, this political etching of the time, uh, just titled simply the repeal here at the top, or you can see it down here, um, it's note, noted as the repeal or, if you, I'm going to zoom it in, the funeral procession of Miss Americ Stamp. Okay, so it's a funeral procession. So if we go back and look at what's going on here, we can kind of see at the beginning we see a, um, a preacher of some kind. Interestingly, we have a dog here. What might that dog represent? And you can notice what you notice what he's doing down there. And you have some uh, so, uh, solemn-faced, wigged uh, gentleman. Uh, looks like they're carrying, uh, let's see, the fl some flags up there. I'm not sure what those are. Here's the here's the key feature. Here's the uh, the small coffin. Uh, question for you guys is why is the coffin small, and what's in the coffin? So think about that. And then you can see here uh, some others here uh, in the background. So this is big funeral procession. And then if you look at the background as well, we see what is in the harbor here. Okay, ships. Where should the ships be? Well, think about it. If they're merchant ships, they should be where? Perhaps out delivering goods? So why aren't these ships out delivering goods and selling their goods? And also, if we look into the, the harbor areas here, we can see inside all these areas that should be loaded with goods, they're fairly empty. And so if, uh, taking into uh, account what, what all is going on here, there's an, uh, a clear indication that this death to this uh, Stamp Act here uh, was, a, was a hard blow to the British. And although the Stamp Act was repealed, the British were by no means uh, done trying to uh, tax the colonists. So in 1767, they instituted what are known as the Townsend Acts, and they taxed uh, a variety of goods. So you had tea, one of the very... Uh, uh, pop, popular staple drink at the time. Uh, lead items were, ta were taxed as well. Uh, paper, so anything with paper was taxed. Glass, so anything made of glass, uh, the colonists had to pay a tax. And paint. So a wide variety of different goods are all taxed in this, uh, in this new tax. Um, and um, 
merchants still continue to try to uh, skirt around uh, these different taxes. So if you can imagine, oops, if you can imagine, uh, I'm trying to just grab the T here. If you can imagine them, all the ships like this one, which is the USS Liberty, trying to confiscate and and uh, uh, put different goods on their ship and try to uh, take them uh, through uh, British and around British customs. The British were getting pretty upset by this, trying to avoid the tea tax. So ships like the Liberty would try to would try to sneak by. And unfortunately, what happened is in this case, the Liberty was searched, and uh, the owners of the of the ship Liberty, along with these guys that we know, the Sons of Liberty, they began to um, attack different, they attacked the Customs House in Boston. And this continuing violence, this continuing resisting, uh, resisting to the new taxes, continued to put more and more stress um, in the area of Boston and the Massachusetts colony. And so the British, in response, roll these guys right here into Boston. So troops now are in Boston, they're everywhere, and the Americans, especially in this in Boston and the Massachusetts area, are getting more and more um, accustomed to the idea of independence, and this idea that the British are abusing their power, and now we have foreign troops in our land, and Americans at this point are starting to get fed up and saying they had enough. Things really boil over a few a few years later in what's known historically uh, as the Boston Massacre. Um, it's an interesting story, and one that we'll look at here through the famous painting or engraving, uh, supposedly done by Paul Revere here, uh, this gentleman here who was uh, at the time a silversmith in Boston, and also does uh, and some engraving, and we'll get back to his uh, participation in this. Uh, engraving here in a moment, but uh, uh, on a cold, on a cold day in Boston, um, uh, some of these, uh, s some of the citizens here, are upset about the new duties and taxes they had to pay. Start to harass a customs official at a local customs house or a place you'd go to buy, uh, pay your taxes. Um, start throwing snowballs um, and uh, start to get pretty violent. This is a mob here. This is not just a friendly uh, group of uh, men and women. This is a mob. And so uh, for reinforcements, uh, the general brings in uh, a set of troops here, and you can see them here in this, in this engraving. And they're brought in to try to keep the peace. Um, things get violent. Um, um, snow, again, snow, ice, uh, clubs are thrown. And um, one of the British officers shoots uh, into the crowd, even though uh, the commander never gave the order to fire. But in this engraving, you can see here, it looks as though the British soldiers are clearly uh, interested, excited, happy, almost gleeful at what they're doing. Well, if we, we zoom back here and go over here, we look at the, the chaos and the bloodshed over here on this side, and we can see... Um, you know, this dead guy and this person. This person's injured, people trying to help, people scared. You can see this hand uh, up and uh, holding up his hand like, no, no, please don't shoot. Fear, chaos, um, disorder. Uh, and again, contrasted with these vicious, angry, um, um, calculated British soldiers taking out this, this terrible massacre on the citizens of Boston. Um... So what is this? How accurate is truly this painting? And what we come to find out is that it's fairly inaccurate. It's one point of view. Um, it's Paul Revere's, again, a patriot, a revolutionary living in Boston. Um, and it really uh, portrays the British soldiers in a bad light. In fact, during their trial, um, they're found not guilty of murder. Um, it, even though it was named, again, you see the title up here, Bloody Massacre, Five people died, four at the scene, and then one later on. So it wasn't a, an absolutely uh, horrific massacre. When usually we think of massacre, we think of deaths on an unimaginable scale or unimaginable violence. This was pure and simple an accident, an accident in which some very scared British soldiers uh, reacted to uh, what was a mob forming in front of them. 
And if we look at this dog here, uh, an interesting uh, piece of uh, uh, an odd placement of a dog in this scene, calm as can be. And the reason the dog is there is that uh, Paul Revere actually took this engraving, redid it. Uh, so someone else originally had made this. He redid it and added this dog as his own signature. But in truth, um, the Boston Massacre, or the Bloody Massacre perpetrated on King Street, as the title says, um, was originally the work of somebody else. So again, it's important to think of this, this piece of work here as, again, a piece of propaganda. A piece of propaganda that was used um, as a way to get people, again, upset uh, with British rule. And it worked very, very effectively. But it's only telling you part of the story. Interestingly, does anyone know, or can you think, who would have represented or been the lawyer for the British soldiers during the trial? Why not? None other than John Adams who was a Boston uh, lawyer at the time and cousin to um, patriot Samuel Adams. And Adams um, represented these British soldiers and found out and presented the truth and was able to uh, set them free. Although they had to leave the colonies, um, they were not found guilty of murder, as which is what most people in Boston at the time wanted to uh, see them found guilty of. The next event, again, centered in Boston, is the famous Boston Tea Party of 1773. Um, and it's important to step back and take a look at the tea tax, which was, after all of these things going on, after the uh, Boston Massacre, after the, the, the Townsend Acts and the, the uprising against those, everything, all taxes were eventually again taken away except for tea. The tea tax was left on, and yet still colonists were furious at this tax. But it's important to ask the question, was the tax on tea really that big a deal? Was it really expensive? In fact, if a colonist drank a gallon of tea a day, he or she would pay a whopping $1 in tax at the end of the year. So it's not as if the colonists were uh, terribly overtaxed. They still pay, pay just a fraction of the tax of uh, citizens back in England. But again, it's the perception that they were being overtaxed, which was driving this revolution. So to set up the Boston Tea Party, what had happened here was that the British, British East India Tea Company was given a permission um, by the British Parliament. Uh, they were allowed to sell tea directly to the colonists, undercutting American tea merchants. So what that mean, meant was that if you looked at the, uh, the price of tea uh, as a colonist living in America, and you had... Um, U.S. tea, uh, or I guess it would be American tea at the time, costing this much, so a higher price. But you had uh, you had this British tea costing uh, a much lower price. You, as a citizen, are going to choose, obviously, to buy the cheaper uh, British tea. And that's what drove the Sons of Liberty uh, and, and groups of men to dress up and as you can see, dress up as Native Americans, and to go and dump um, millions of dollars worth of British tea into the Boston Harbor in the famous act of resistance. A question to ask and to think about is, why would they have dressed up like Native Americans? And a final act of um, defiance, or I guess I should say the British in the final act of an attempt to get revenue uh, for Parliament, they passed what the, the colonists came to call the Intolerable Acts. They were actually called the Coercive Acts, but the colonists ended up calling them the Intolerable Acts because they felt, they felt that these things were intolerable. Now this is uh, Lord North, okay, current Prime Minister of Parliament now, and he decides to do the following things, and these are in your book here. We're going to close Boston Harbor until they pay for all the ruined tea they just dumped overboard. Massachusetts Charter is canceled. Uh, that means uh, Massachusetts now no longer has um, the right to operate uh, un unless under the direction of the British governor. Um, any royal officials accused of crimes, these are British officials, accused of crimes are sent to Britain for trial. This let them face a more friendly judge and jury. 
because what was happening in Boston and Massachusetts at the time is that people loyal to the crown, what we know as loyalists, uh, they were not getting fair trials in the colonies in Massachusetts. So they were now sent back home to face trial. And finally, General Thomas Gage became the new governor of Massachusetts. And so, if you can imagine, the governor of this colony is now um, a general, uh, a, a general um, in the British Army. So he and all of his redcoats are in the streets of Boston. And so this is, in the end, the final straw that leads to the first battle of the Civil War, or excuse me, the Revolutionary War, which we'll get into in the next video, the Battle of Lexington and Concord.